Ladies and gentlemen, if you could take a seat, please. We are going to make a start in just a moment. Um, so this is a, a double welcome. Um, one of, this is a, this is um, a bit like the uh, the kickoff in the uh, Premier League, where they're waiting for the telly to kind of uh, kick kick in. Um, because we one of the things that we're attempting this time, which is the first time, no, I tell a lie, the very first. LCDN conference that we had in Loughborough, we tried uh, streaming. I think I remember Ben was actually was in, in India, in Delhi, and was one of the few people that actually managed to connect. I'm told that we have about 120 people registered online to follow us at various points over the course of the next three days. Um, but um, so this first session uh, will be a little bit, I think we're using Stephen uh, uh, as a, and Jiska as a bit of a guinea pig here in terms of how we set this um, this first session up. But um, firstly, I just wanted to say a very big welcome to everybody to this seventh LCE again conference. Good timing, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, we are, I think, really excited to see we've got about 145 people signed up for this conference over the course of the next three days. I think quite a few people are probably sheltering at the hotel at the moment because of the rain. The weather forecast is to improve slightly over the course of the coming days. Um, before I go through some of the mechanics of um, how things will run over the course of the next three days, I, I thought it, the really nicest thing to do would be to invite Nick Clifford to come and say a few words. If you could do it here, Nick, then that means that people following online will also be able to see you. Um, so I'll pass over to Nick. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm here today because I'm the Dean of what's personally social, political and geographical sciences but very shortly to become social scientist at Loughborough. Um, I'm a geographer by training, so I'm not completely ignorant of the kind of things that you'll be talking about. Um, I get to introduce quite a lot of events and discipline myself with the Danish pastries and only two copies at any one time. And I often come on and say what I hope is not completely foolish words at the beginning. And then you know, quite often I'm not glad to get away, but I've got other things to do. Today, I genuinely regret um, having to slip away very quickly because the kinds of issues you're talking about, the programme you've got, is something which I think is not only of critical global importance, it's important to us at Loughborough, and I should formally extend a welcome to a very wet Loughborough today. Um, but it's something which intellectually, I think, is exciting and is truly transdisciplinary in its nature. And it's very rare that we get something that's truly transdisciplinary. For me, I could shut up really and just say that what I think you're doing is so important because you're actually bringing nexus studies to life. I was introduced to the water, energy and food nexus by Judith Rees um, at LSE. He was a great mentor of mine in my early days. She became president of the Royal Geographical Society, but he's probably quite famous as the first and female chair of Ofwat um, right back when that first got going. And I think she realised that the interconnectivity of both the global environmental systems and the global, if you want, human, economic and developmental systems couldn't be and mustn't be separated. And so she was ahead of the game for geographers of thinking about complex and wicked problems. Thinking of your title today, I thought, well, the words are really, actually, the letters are quite important. Let's take low carbon. I come at carbon, actually, as an environmental scientist. And we know the importance of the carbon cycle. We know its ecological importance. You hear most about it, of course, in terms of its climatic importance. But of course, it's intrinsic to human importance as well. We're all made of it, let alone how we need to use it every day. And that brings us, of course, to energy as well. I mean, speaking partly as a, as a sort of a hybrid physicist, without energy, nothing's going to work. We're not going to translate anything. We're not going to have any motility in the systems that we have. And we have to manage and cope and produce and ration and distribute that energy. And I worked for quite a while with the British Council on low cost, low energy uh, water purification um, technologies um, in remote communities. And I've since maintained an interest in remote com uh, communities and hydrogen as a form of energy buffering as well. So the energy is just inescapable. Um, we've either got too much, too little, not in the right place or the right time. And then there's development as well. Now, development, I think, is often cast as some sort of post-colonial idea. And for me, it's nothing to do with that. We're all involved, I think, in a much larger scale ongoing human project. 
So development for most people, I'm acutely aware, although I have no direct experience of this, is about life and death and the day to day. But it's actually a basic humanitarian issue as well. It's about all of us being part of global earth and being on a project to achieve, to be the best we can be. And I think it's a right that everybody is given that opportunity to be the best that we can be. Loughborough, in a sense, makes a habit of that. I can't resist saying our latest league table performance is stellar. In terms of the education that we offer and the perceptions that have, not particularly just for the research that we have, but we're trying to genuinely enable a new generation of people to take themselves, others, and the world forward. And I can't think of a higher project than that one. So that's the development side for me. And then just as important, and I've seen Ed and others and all of you around, is the network. Because without the network, we're not going to have that web of interconnectivity. We're not going to have the global reach. We're not going to have the diversity of opinion. We're not going to have that resource base that we can call on. And I know a lot of you know a lot more than I do about distributed networks and distributed delivery. But basically, it's all about making the whole greater than the sum of its parts. And I think it's networks and networking that can do that. It puts policymakers together with the academics, but none of that would matter if we didn't just have the people on the ground. So it's with some enthusiasm that I say welcome. You have a genuine apology from me that I can't stay. I wish you well. I'm pleased to see so many, and I gather that you are going global, as Ed said in a minute. I've only ever done one webinar type thing, and that was for ice skating, figure skating coaching. So <laughs> that, one, that one was reasonably successful, but cost us, some of us, quite a lot of money to um, uh, actually follow it through on that in the days that we thought. We thought my son was going to be an Olympian, but it never came off. But there you go, you can all hope in that way. You're striving for excellence. You're bringing the nexus to life. And speaking as an academic bureaucrat for a minute, we talk glibly about impact as if impact is just another box, as if it exists out there in some kind of isolation. But what it is, is not just a translation of the best research into communities. It's actually transdisciplinary, as I said at the beginning. It's about using that community, drawing on that community knowledge in a type of feedback loop to find out what will work, what is best, and how we can enrich that. So I actually genuinely congratulate you on having what I think is one of the highest intellectual projects that you can have, one of the most people-centered, bringing technology and ideas to lives and livelihood. And hopefully, and I'm absolutely convinced, that many in the room will actually leave making the world a better place. And again, I think that is a stellar achievement. So welcome. I'm going to leave you in excellent hands with Ed and his team, who I know are amongst the most committed individuals I've ever met in 30 years in the Academy. And I'm sure that's something that you're sharing as well. So welcome, goodbye. I hope there's another chance to see you at some stage. And I hope the technology works um, <laughs> as well. Thanks very much indeed, Nick. Um, okay, I will stand up here for as short a period of time as possible so we move into the... Uh, the meat of the, uh, um, the, the day's activities. Um, just really some general, um, I suppose, sort of introductory um, information um, in terms of things like fire alarms and all this kind of stuff, which we always have to do on these things. So firstly, uh, there are no fire drills. So there is a fire alarm, it's a real one, but don't, <laughs> but don't panic. Um, you'll see that the fire exits are all uh, outlined in red, so that really helps with the don't panic, doesn't it? So, um, so there are some here, there are some in the Babbage area out here, and also when we're in the Turing room later on. So there is a fire alarm, just make your way to the fire exits. The, uh, we are meant to assemble at fire assembly point one, which is out at the back of the building. Okay, so everyone goes out of the back of the building. If you're upstairs, you need to come downstairs first. <laughs> and after those same exits. Um, Wi-Fi, um, if there is free Wi-Fi, you do have to register with Imago, but if you um, click onto the Imago network, and then the code, once you've registered, is 8323. Okay, that's 8323. Any of the, the staff will be able to help you with that in case you uh, forget to write that down or whatever. Um, 
So, uh, I think the other thing, that, other general things to say is if you are one of the speakers whose uh, travel is being met, if you could um, get your receipts and things to Joni um, on, the, on the main desk or as you see around over the course of the next three days, um, that would be helpful. Don't everyone run and do it now or should be inundated, uh, but if you could. Um, we are, as you know, live streaming. Um, so again, welcome to everyone that's following us as we're live streaming the event. Also, we will be recording these live streams and they'll be available on the LCDN and Smart Villages websites. Um, and just again, if anyone is speaking today and has concerns over that, please do let us know before your session <laughs> so that we can deal with, uh, with, with that. Uh, one final thing on social media is um, the Twitter hashtag for this conference is LCDN2018. We're really innovative with things like that. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll get some discussion and debate going um, amongst those people that are following us online. Um, if you are following us online, um, hello again. Um, then um, please do, uh, if you have questions for the speakers, if you uh, make those questions known through the question feature in the GoToWebinar software, then Bernie over there will be uh, following the questions and we'll feed those into the question session. So we'll hopefully have questions from all around the world rather than just from everyone that's in the, um, in the auditorium here today. Um, I think that's everything that I needed to say. Anyone from my colleagues think I've missed anything in terms of the introductions? Um, I suppose um, bathrooms out this way and out kind of under the stairs, as it, as it were. Not, uh, that sounds really bad. <laughs> the rooms are under the stairs. <laughs> okay, in terms of the... the Okay, the LCDN team, in terms of everyone that's kind of running and, and managing things here today. John Cloak is the network manager. Uh, ben Campbell is down here at the, at the front here, who's the other national coordinator based up in Durham. Um, also, in terms of uh, full-time research associates with the LCDN, Long Seng and Britta. And Surabi is around somewhere as well, who's also working with us at the moment. So, um, so that's the team. If you get... Joni is, Joni is out on the registration desk, but yes, absolutely. Joni is the other most important member of the team out, out, out there at the moment. Um, just so that hopefully everyone would have seen the, uh, the conference um, program, um, hopefully it should be relatively straightforward in terms of what we're going to go through. In terms of the um, outline today, today is probably the most um, presentation oriented of the, of the three days. So we will spend a lot of the day in here today. We have this initial session, I'm going to hand over to Stephen in just a moment or two. And this initial session is around the whole theme of the conference, which is transforming energy access, which is also the theme of, of one of DIFID's major investments that we've been working on, and which we're really lucky to have the, the, um, the Research Programme Delivery Consortium, um, who are running the, uh, the, the, uh, the T programme here as well. John Lane, where are you, John? John Lane at the front here, who's the, what's your title for the T? Program director. Program director. <laughs> <laughs> so we pause over the grammar. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Program director. And also Jiska is around somewhere who's one of the core team members for the oh, oh next to John, sorry. <laughs> of the core team. So we're gonna hear from from the, uh, about the transforming energy access program, but also to have a debate around what we might mean by transforming energy access, which is really what the whole of this conference is about, bringing together many of the programs that are supported and developed through the T program to consider what do we mean by transforming energy access? What is the, the, uh, the transformation that we're trying to achieve? What is uh, missing at the moment? And how can we help the RPDC and, the, and DFID in terms of how this progresses over the course of the, of the next three years or so? And also where that T program and our intents as a community of scholars, where are we going in terms of the whole energy access? debate and what can we do as an academic community in collaboration with a whole range of stakeholders and I think one of the things that's really exciting about today is that we have a truly multi-sectoral audience here yes there are quite a lot of academics drawn from lots of different backgrounds from engineering to social sciences of all different persuasions to many colleagues from uh, a whole variety of different countries in the global south and beyond uh, who've joined us uh, today and also uh, a range of uh, people from the business world uh, from various companies funded through the um, through the Energy Catalyst program and through other routes. So bringing all of these people together is exactly the kind of thing that the LCDM was originally set up to do, uh, and that's why we're all here, I would say. 
So without any further ado, I'm going to ask Stephen to, uh, to come and speak. Um, are you there to set us up? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much, Ed. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll stand back a little bit so that people online have a chance of uh, seeing more than just my chin. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I am um, I have the, the pleasure, really, of being the senior responsible owner for the Transforming Energy Access Programme, which, is, as Ed mentioned, is a substantial programme of DFID support to, um, to this agenda. Um, it contains, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of briefly run through you know, what, what we think and what DFID thinks we mean by Transforming Energy Access and how we've reflected that into a programme of support um, which runs until 2021, some of the elements of that. And um, then I'll also maybe talk a bit about what the, the wider implication, where that sits, how that fits into also there's a wider program of support that's out there to take ideas and to take um, change to scale, um, but also particularly what the role of um, academia and, and in UK um, academics in particular is in that. So the T program, as we like to call it, um, it has a, a few, this, this is simply the project purpose. I'll, I'll take you through it step by step because there's a few elements to it. The first is um, it's about supporting early stage testing and scale up. So I work in the research and evidence division in DFID. There's lots of different divisions in DFID with different responsibilities, but our part of the, the picture is really this research, the, the evidence to drive decision making, to drive change. Um, and this program is around is about the early stage testing and scale up. Um, we think about that as research, development and demonstration, our D and D. But also the process by which those um, can move to scale. And um, we're interested in technologies predominantly, the, the, the range of technologies and the way that technology, not just the hardware, the software as well, the kind of the wider conception of technologies and practices and approaches, um, and also the business models that underpin those. It's no use having a wonderful bit of kit or another wonderful offer if, if the business model doesn't work to let you scale that up or to let people access it in a sustainable way. Um, and then what we're all about and what the objective is, affordable clean energy based services um, for poor households and enterprises. So we're interested in this. It, it's about a sustainable source of energy um, and improved energy access, really aligned with the, with the Global Goal 7 um, for both households and enterprises. I think there's a lot of interest and you'll see a lot of the themes in here about productive uses and about how we can help people to expand their um, their ability to pay and their and their um, their the, the benefits they derive from it, not just services in the home. So that's T. Um, that's the objective. This is how we've kind of interpreted that into um, a program. So there's four major kind of elements to it. And um, the first is about stimulating technology innovation. So this is from the very earliest stage ideas, um, and this is the, one of the areas where I think governments globally sort of see an. an all obvious role. There's a market failure in the, in the early stage ideas space. We um, put £50 million pounds through the Energy Catalyst um, platform um, alongside other government departments and research councils to so far support 73 projects and we'll um, also be taking part in um, the upcoming round six of Energy Catalyst. Um, um, to name, to basically, really, um, Catalyst supports early, mid and late stage projects. Um, and really does support and enable partnerships um, internationally. We very much support um, international participants in those projects. And um, yeah, it's kind, of a, it's kind of like a classic sort of open sort of innovation and research um, call. The second component um, is about accelerating innovation. And there we work with the Shell Foundation. Um, hopefully many of you will be aware of the Shell Foundation already, but they have a very kind of um, long-standing kind of incubation and business and technology development and um, work. We co-fund with, uh, with them. We put in 30 million, they put in 30 million. USAID put in a, a chunk. So you can see it's a substantial um, body of support. And so far, there's 45 um, projects and partners supported through that. Now, that's a relationship we've had um, over a number of years, and it's, it's included early stage support to companies like MCOPA, um, who have gone on to become very significant in the sector. Um, and 
we're, that we, we continue to work through that. That takes a bit more of a directed approach, a bit more support, you know, ongoing, more than just the money. Um, but a very interesting package of work. Then I'll talk in a second about the kind of innovation supported through that. And the bottom two components are, the top two are quite heavily focused around about, not entirely, but mainly about, about the innovators and about those people who want to take these projects forward. Um, the bottom two are more about the networks and the partnerships and the basis with, within which entrepreneurs and individuals can, can thrive. Um, and the bottom left, we have partnerships. So we're, we're just in the middle of programming, um, not the middle, but towards the end, we hope, <laughs> <laughs> of, um, of, of, of programming the, uh, the partnerships um, part of this. But um, we, this is really about going beyond individual firms. How, how can we su support platforms, partnerships that connect more than one firm, more than one entities um, that can connect with um, different kinds of investors, can bring new um, opportunities really um, beyond that of the, of the individual uh, proponents of technologies. Um, the two projects that we've supported so, so far under that are, are the Energize Africa crowdfunding platform, um, which again I'll talk about a bit more in a second, um, and also we're working with um, Acumen on their Pioneer um, Energy Investment Initiative, which is really about um, connecting and using the equity as a, as a way to, to accelerate energy access. Uh, and then the fourth one is about skills and expertise. So partnerships are great. We, we'll, we'll talk about the different ways that we can support connections, but then there's, there's a fundamental requirement to build and, and su support the ways in which um, pe people are able to, to generate new ideas, to deliver projects, to deliver sustained change over time. Um, and we also have a program there. We've been working with LCDN and supporting them and in their work so far, and we have um, some new work, which I'm sure Yiska will talk about in a second, um, about how we can build, help support the building of that capacity to sustain really all of the rest of the, the ambition. So, um, and then the last component um, is really in the center there, which is the research program delivery consortium Ed mentioned to help, um, yeah, hold it all together, help and make sure that the different parts of that program are talking to each other, benefiting from synergies, um, and that learning is being exchanged. So that's how we've, um, put the program together, that's how we've understood the, um, the role of TEA. So just to put TEA into context, so as I mentioned, TEA is early stage, TEA is research. Um, DFID has another set of programs, um, particularly targeting the off-grid e energy access space. Um, I won't go into the, the bigger picture of all the, the DFID energy support, but we also have, have, so you can see TEA over there on the left. Um, in the middle we have um, Africa Clean Energy, which is, a, which is a more of a, a business-focused challenge fund, more focused on countries in which DFID is supporting um, scale up, especially household solar, which is one of the technology areas we've seen the most <coughs> growth in. And then on the right hand side, you have MCDC, which is the UK's development bank. And so the UK development bank has a series of debt and equity instruments, which are more or less commercial in their terms, but exclusively focused on low income countries and developing countries. So um, in fact, MCOPA um, is, was, was most recently the first um, household solar or energy access firm to benefit from the off-grid debt fund um, in East Africa. So that kind of gives you a sense of what, how we're trying to support this transition from, from early stage ideas through to more or less commercial funding. Um, and just to kind of also round out that picture, there's a series of other programs that we have, results-based financing, um, country-level programs, challenge funds, which are um, sort of augment that and go beyond um, household solar. And then we have a series of other um, programs which are kind of in development or in different stages, um, which again are about sort of complement that. So we, tr we, have a, we try to sort of focus in on what the early stage space is, but see that in the bigger picture of how we're supporting that, that change. This is um, a very busy slide, but you can look at it at your leisure on the, um, uh, and, and later on if you like. So this is the, this is the different pr projects and support we've put through the Shell Foundation and done in partnership. Um, you can see there the way that we've kind of, or the way that Shell Foundation largely has, has kind of put it together. We've got household services, energy for business, um, which is being one as productive use technologies, and then we've got off-grid utilities, which is really mini grids, more or less. And then you've got support to the firms, these lead firms that we hope are going to create new markets and opportunities. Across the middle, we have enablers, which is um, addressing different kind of uh, cross-cutting challenges, which affect whatever you're trying to do, you're going to have to deal with issues to do with 
um, capacity and, and human capital or gender issues. Um, or you might, or the, the, there's always an importance of, again, a partnerships in there. Um, along the bottom, you have finance. So there's lots of great ideas out there. But if the great ideas can't find um, financing, then they're not going to go very far. So again, there's a series of, of platforms and, and financial um, intermediaries which we've supported, um, which will hopefully, in turn, and, and already have, support these, these ideas and the, 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 the projects. I want to quickly flash up Energize Africa because, again, it's not a technology, it's a financial innovation, really. Um, and we've been supporting this, um, and so far, um, 30 different um, energy access projects have, have received crowdfunding, mainly from the UK public. So we're connecting the UK public with off-grid um, energy enterprises, in this case, Household Solar. So far, there's one um, clean cooking project, actually, so far, been funded through this. Um, so around about £4 million pounds raised so far, around about £300,000 a month at the moment. Um, and it's really only just growing. It just started off in September. So um, an interesting, again, way of a platform connecting the working capital debt needs of, of household solar companies and other companies with um, a different kind of financial um, pool, which is the, um, the public. And this is, is a very quick um, illustration of what we, we hope happens. We, we, the um, T is £65 million. Pounds. It's a substantial chunk of money. But it's still it's, it's tiny compared with the scale of the challenge we're trying to address and the financing needs. So we like to try to use the money in ways which um, scale up and, and can, can grow. So this is this is Acumen um, Pioneer Energy Investment Initiative, and they come in and support and provide equity um, early stage to energy enterprises. And then this is the uh, scale of the funds that we've raised after the Acumen investment. So again, it's, it's a dealing with that early stage issue and helping um, the firms move to the next stage. Um, finally, I just wanted to highlight the example of um, LCEDN, um, and I think it's, it's been clear from the outset that we wanted to try and find a way in through T to support improved kind of improved productivity and connectivity between some of the energy enterprises and the innovators who are delivering in the field, who are delivering the customers, and the academic um, community and research community who who, who sometimes are those people as well, and sometimes are, are the, the incubators for the innovators of tomorrow, but also who I think could potentially play a really powerful role in helping those innovators better understand their customers, the opportunities, the challenges, um, and also doing what for many innovators is not actually their core competency, which is robust research. Um, and I think that is, is quite an important um, sort of synergy potentially, which we don't see as much of as I think we could, of, um, of, of the, the research, the kind of the analysis going into what's happening with these products. Are they working? Are they generating impacts? Where are those impacts being achieved? And how could we be maximizing those? Um, and I think similarly with some of the, um, the community connections and, and potentially also through community-based organizations and NGOs, again, I think the enterprise is quite often focused on the customer but there's quite often a, a context within which that needs to be kind of considered, especially for things like mini grids, which are sort of by nature community um, level infrastructure. So I'm sure over the next uh, couple of days, there'll be a lot of discussion about these interconnections and how we can kind of support those partnerships, because I think in the end, it's those kind of pr productive connections that are gonna help us get to the, to the next stage and closer, hopefully to transforming energy access. So I'll leave it there, um, and yeah, we're we'll happy to, to have some questions after Jessica as well. So, double that tape. <laughs> so, um, Stephen, thank you ever so much. Um, I think that also, just to illustrate that some of the uh, people you were just talking about, so Energy for Impact, in terms of their work on the crowdfunding, they'll be here with us on Friday in a session which we're also hoping that Acumen are going to uh, contribute to remotely. So quite a lot of these connections is something we're trying to achieve through this, this particular uh, event. So without any further ado though, just I think hopefully building on some of those final points that, um, <laughs> that, was the word, that uh, Stephen was making, so no, no, no pressure there, just um, over to, to Jista, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much Ed. And um, I'd first like to check with Benny what the camera is pointing at at the moment. Because <laughs> I can't, can't see that from here, and it's slightly concerning. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks very much, Ed, for uh, for having me speak here as well. So 
I'll try and pick up from uh, a little bit where Stephen has left and really start talking about the skills and expertise development needs that um, that I've been heavily involved with for, for the past year. And uh, to just go in a little bit more detail there um, so that you're understanding the context in which I'm speaking is like what, what have we been trying to do in the skills, uh, in the skills component? And really what we, uh, what we set out to do is like to identify initiatives and institutions through which we can support building the skills and expertise needed to achieve and sustain energy access scale up. So that has both a short term and a more longer term component. Uh, but that also involves addressing local research and innovation capacity needs, professional development, vocational skills, and design a program of support. And um, yeah, as, as part of that, uh, we're, we've identified two initiatives uh, that will be supported uh, through this T initiative. Um, yeah, we've extensively engaged with different organizations across Sub-Saharan Africa, um, South Asia, and uh, other international actors that are, are in the sphere. Um, have been trying to foster links between science and engineering academies and uh, develop further collaboration with uh, established networks. And just um, to avoid a whole lot of questions afterwards, because um, we have focused on a whole series of different environments for, for skills building. So that includes enterprising, the overall enabling environment, tertiary institutions, um, and also end users. And, um, I really need to cut this short because I want to spend the other half of my presentation on uh, something a bit more reflective. Um, tertiary institutions uh, are going to be what, what uh, the T will be uh, investing in and will really be trying to foster in the next three and a half years. Because uh, through our scoping study, we've really, really found that people on the ground trying to scale up energy access are having immense challenges in attracting and retaining local talent. One of these areas is at mid-management level, but it was an, like a really big uh, issue overall. And um, enterprises, like they struggle to compete on a salary basis uh, with other more established sectors such as telecoms, um, but also like the competencies required as part of their activities in uh, this emerging sector range from like specific energy related content to more generic uh, managerial to more and more life skills, problem solving skills finance and leadership and um, really and as an academic I was slightly disappointed because so many stakeholders refer to this mismatch between what the market needs and what recent graduates come out of university with and um, yeah uh, thinking back to when I left university the shock of the real world where you suddenly need to be able to do all these things that you've never been taught and especially also in African universities the curriculum is heavily heavily focused on technological skills and, and not on the skills that you need to uh, function as an individual individual in, uh, in different sectors uh, but also um, because we're talking about off-grid energy here there's now like real identity within higher education institutions uh, regarding off-grid energy like there's no one feeder degree for the sector um, and as I said most of them remain very uh, technically focused with very few multidisciplinary offerings especially um, yeah, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, also, um, women remain underrepresented in the private sector at virtually all skill levels, and that is a serious issue, and we have to address it. But let's address it as part of the wider initiatives that's, that we're going to do. Um, the good thing, though, and, and I think that will show uh, in the next couple of days as well, there is a strong presence of gender and energy networks and practitioners in the various countries. Um, and then the final one is that there's, there's few regional south-south interactions and collaborations on the continent between tertiary institutions. We're building them, but these things take time. And we need to try, try and foster these networks, expand them, work together to try uh, and create enough momentum to really steamroll uh, our energy access. And um, yeah, so after the scoping study, uh, we've now started to build uh, uh, yeah, two cases for which we are going to try, uh, for which we're not going to try and get support, but for which we will get support uh, from DFID. And the first one is uh, really focused on the energy sector itself. So through an off-grid energy talent development program, which we're really hoping that this, uh, that this initiative will improve the linkages between the sector and uh, recent graduates, for example, by uh, graduate internship placement, but also mid-management training and bringing together people in various, uh, various events and targeting junior and mid-management levels. 
And then the second one is this African-Asian Academic Partnership for Energy Access, in which we take a more longer-term approach and start working on this curriculum and try and integrate off-grid energy skills into existing curriculums or where needed in, into new courses. And uh, through that, um, yeah, so, so we're setting up like a technical assistance uh, fund through which universities can apply for support and will be assisted in integrating off-grid into their curriculum. So this is really something where I'm, where I'm quite happy to just have a quick slot to speak here, because it is quite likely that we'll be calling on you for support. We, we need you all in this, like academics, practitioners. Um, yeah, so please watch this space and uh, respond if we call or, or email you. And moving from here, like I know uh, I'm partly representing uh, the TA program uh, for skills and expertise development at the moment, but I want to take up that hat now and take on a more academic hat for, uh, for the next several minutes uh, yeah, to, to just really start reflecting on this transforming energy access. What are we talking about? What are we trying to do? And um, yeah, obviously as academics, we embarked on this T program and started reflecting, which is very dangerous thing sometimes. <laughs> as it costs you a lot of coffee, sometimes it's sneaky gin and tonic because the challenge is overwhelming. And um, yeah, but I really want to use the rest of my time to, to bring some points at the forefront, which I personally feel that are crucial for us as like academics, practitioners, policymakers, and communities to take into account when we are going into, uh, into this process. And uh, the first thing that I really want to reflect on is the, the conference theme itself. And um, I'm pretty sure you all agree that providing access to energy is a good thing, right? Um, but the challenge for doing that is enormous. And um, yeah, so as a non-Asian speaker, I did a little Google search on who, what does transforming actually mean? And I need to go a heart attack there because we're talking about alteration, change, conversion, and moving in from one state into another through some kind of metamorphosis. Pretty frightening. So in which we have like structural changes to the energy system that are taking place through some kind of growth and differentiation. And um, similarly, the word revolution popped up, which got me even more frightened. And um, yeah, and then after all these cups of coffee, I like started to get pretty scared, like transforming energy access if it might have pictures because it creates a great acronym. Is that one of the reasons? Couldn't you have just called it Achieving Energy Access, AEA, or Promoting Energy Access, PEA? That like, would have made me a whole lot more comfortable uh, in some points. But at the same time, I think, yeah, different has made a great, great call there because adding the single word of transformation, we show that we want to change something at a systematic level. So through like a deep and targeted process of real change and not just throwing some money out there to plug it on the holes. Um, but also like the complexity and the magnitude of the challenge becomes then immediately apparent. And no matter how frightening, it is something we have to deal with and we shall deal with. And this conference really, uh, I feel is like a unique opportunity to explore with academics, practitioners, policymakers, and even uh, donors here uh, what are some of these key themes around transformation, uh, including from an ethical angle, technological angle, planning, policy, last mile distribution, skills and waste? Just have a look at the program and, and you'll see a lot of different themes popping up. And through these themes, we can critically engage in what our transformation sets out to achieve, for whom we're trying to achieve this, by whom, and um, yeah, yeah, by whom it is we, we want to achieve this. And um, then there's three... Um, key small points that I'll, uh, I'll try and make in the next few minutes with regard to that. And, and the first one is this well, very unelegant title there, Energy For Whom Doing What? And Stephen already touched upon that briefly. Um, but yeah, so much hard work, goodwill, money and time has been spent on improving access to energy in the past decade. We've had all these like exciting technological advances and new business models, like the space is buzzing with activity passionate people that actually want to make a difference. And um, yeah, so as a result, there have been remarkable advances in energy access for rural and urban households. But um, a lot of the private sector solutions so far have focused on delivering at a household level. And it's great, and let's not look down on this. It's really important. It creates beautiful infographics about how many households we manage to connect in one way or another. 
sexy numbers that we can throw around in presentations, but is it really transformational? And um, yeah, so despite these large steps in the number of electricity connections, that um, yeah, the, the level of service that people might get from these connections varies immensely. And um, as well as their ability to use those services to improve their lives. And um, yeah, and that's because our experience shows that uh, ec economies don't automatically grow by providing rural and urban people with a power line or installing some solar panels. It requires, um, yeah, building better lives requires energy services to power new jobs and enterprises um, and, and people that have the capacity to take these things up. And um, yeah, I just quickly wanted to show you the picture of the multi-tier framework, which actually really thought about this and um, yeah, it can help us to understand how, how can we make that shift and be realistic about what, if we provide a certain level of access, what can we realistically expect people to do with it? Um, yeah, so um, understanding that there's these tiers, and, and I don't want to go into a lot of details because I'm pretty sure that people are familiar with the concept, but how can we make sure that growth in household energy is matched by these productive uses in energy, in particularly areas in which economic growth has been challenging, like a lot of areas in sub-Saharan Africa? And how do we do this in a way in which we uh, are cognizant of local circumstances where we respect the different situation in which we're trying to implement something? And um, that requires a lot of buy-in and participation from people on the ground who actually have a lot of important knowledge to offer to us in that process as well. And um, yeah, see, we know a range of things are required for improving livelihoods, including capacity building, awareness, appropriate finance. And many of us here have made it their life work to be part of this, to be really part of this transformational process. And um, that's really exciting. And that's why like, in the next couple of days at the conference, uh, we see topics like innovative finance, last mile distribution, delivery models, which all highlight the importance uh, to both household and productive uses. And I'll, uh, yeah, I, I just take a brick, uh, broad brush here now and leave the detailed content up to, uh, to all of you and swiftly move on to the next before Ed's going to cut me off. Uh, the second one is really this need for an integrated approach. And if we are to transform energy access, we need to take an integrated approach in our actions and in our thinking. With this, obviously, I mean the integration of energy sources, large, small systems, a wide range of technologies, centralized versus decentralized, low carbon, and various other forms of generation and distribution. But in addition to that, it's important to take this kind of nexus approach, such as including the food, water, health, and gender nexus. And I quite clearly remember uh, sitting around the table with quite a few of you a while ago to, to put a very, very large bit together in which we were then asked how energy relates to the intractable development challenges and um, long, long conversations. And during those conversations, we were like, yeah, energy is really important. And um, yeah, otherwise we can't achieve any of the sustainable development goals pretty much. So we matter. And I think probably in a lot of other universities, the gender people were sitting around the table having exactly that same moment of proud of their individual fields, same as the educational people, the poverty people. And uh, to me, that really just underlines the, the crucial need for this integrated approach between stakeholders, but also across the different sustainable development goals. And we'll have plenty to talk about in the sessions on gender, cooking, under the grid activities, industry innovation, infrastructure uh, and sustainable cities and we're going to bring together expertise from various disciplines as well as across different thematic areas so please like also get out of your comfort zones you can say oh i don't do gender well newsflash we all do gender so come to some of these sessions go to sessions that you normally might not uh, say as an engineer go to or as a social scientist go to some of the technology innovation sections because we need to learn from each other and work together even more closely than we already do to deliver on this transformational energy access. And then the last one, uh, before I quietly go back to my seat. Um, yeah, it's, as, as I said, it's about building bridges and about working together. And as I stated earlier, like truly transforming energy access is really a Herculean effort in uh, that is complex, multi-stakeholder, interdisciplinary, 
and it won't be easy to achieve. And it most certainly won't be achieved if we don't step up and keep changing the way in which we treat our own disciplines, in which we treat our own jobs. Um, and so let's not be naive and think, oh, we can, we can do this by ourselves, because we just can't. And uh, whether we're in the public or private sector, um, yeah, we need each other. And this, this dream of transformative change with regard to energy access needs buy-in from a whole lot of stakeholders, in, including the international community, academics, um, community development groups, governments, communities themselves, finance, and, and I'm really sorry for those of you who are in the private sector, but you've been reduced to the time. <laughs> but yeah, at, late at night, that was really the only. Uh, <laughs> and no, <laughs> Joy, it was the only icon I could find, so no offense meant there. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> fantastic. Um, yeah, so, so we need big business, we need small business, we need, we need the whole, whole group of people together, and let's not forget our nexus friends in different offices across our, our universities. And yeah, I know I always go over time speaking, so I thought I'll, I'll leave the final, final word up to our, our dear friend Paul McCartney, who's just going to say... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll hand it quickly over to Ed now. Well, is, is Indira on the... Is she logged in? And then she's logged in, she's connected, she has no presentation, so she will just talk. So what I think we'll do, if you two are okay with this, is take Indira's talk and then take the questions all together at the end. Yeah. So um, I'm not quite sure because I can't actually see Indira. <laughs> so is Indira going to, are we going to be able to see Indira while she talks? Uh, we're not, we're just going to hear her. Okay, so uh, Indira, we, ah, oh, actually, no, I can, no, we can see her. Bernie, you lied to us. <laughs> Not the first time. <laughs> Indira, perhaps I could ask everyone in the room to say a big hello to Indira. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Indira, you're you're currently muted. Could you take off the mute from your <clears throat> Yeah. Hello everyone. No. Yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> Bernie's going, yes, 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 because he can hear me. Yes, yes, yes. I can hear her. <laughs> <laughs> now? Am I loud enough? Yay! Right, I'm going to hand over to you now. Um, actually, Bernie, we've lost India on the screen. Right? <laughs> that's just on your screen, that's not on everybody else's. Yeah, but it is here. <laughs> picky, picky, picky. <laughs> right. Brilliant. I'm going to hand over to you, Indira. Really, very much, uh, we, we really welcome you to this uh, conference. I hope you've been able to hear something of what's been said thus far. And uh, we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll have some questions overall for all three speakers, if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, let me begin by a short introduction of myself. I'm Indira, and I uh, largely approach the energy issues from a gender perspective as well as from the technology end. And uh, representing from Nepal, I think it would be good if I start off with what the, uh, the term transformation of energy access means to the country. And so far, the country, as you all know, is highly dependent on uh, biomass, and although the country is very rich in hydropower. So just uh, recently, there have been uh, lots of discussions uh, regarding the energy access. And one of the statements that has been going around in the country is that the country needs to diversify and increase the production of electricity in order to reach uh, Mm -hmm. uh, to achieve higher <clears throat> socio-economic development. So this is what is now leading um, 
the energy access issues for the country. But however, uh, this goal has been ha hamstrung and by a number of factors, uh, not least by the decade-long conflict, the red tape, continued political instability, and uh, several issues which uh, are taking uh, is taking time, but we do have a sense that these things will be overcome uh, in the coming years. And uh, crossing my fingers, I, the sooner the better. Uh, we have been going through a uh, lot of discourse on increasing the hydropower in the country. However, as I uh, approach the energy access problem from the gender perspectives, uh, you will agree with me that uh, this then will deal with the population that are, of course, the last mile. Um, there is, uh, um, in terms of energy access, what we see is that uh, we uh, focus on, we usually deal on the um, four A's, that is accessibility, availability, affordability, and awareness. Uh, I would just like to emphasize that these four points need to be looked into not only from the beneficiary's point of view, but from all the actors that are engaged in this sector. And the main, um, we need to adopt a more holistic ap approach instead of working at uh, it in isolation. And those that are working on hydropower try to promote only hydropower. Those that are working on the renewable energy sector, they tend to focus only in that. But then depending upon the needs uh, and the resources, and if the country is to um, have a sovereignty instead of depending upon uh, others uh, where energy is concerned, uh, we need to um, we need to develop the sector as a whole and see the uh, look at the mix of the energy. So um, we are not um, spending our hard on on the um, uh, uh, money, cash, uh, as it looks now, we are spending more on uh, importing f uh, fossil fuel rather than uh, our ex uh, exporting the goods that are in the country, so which is uh, a constraint on the economic development on the whole. Uh, what we see is that, I think Jiska was uh, talking about uh, the skills and expertise. Uh, the challenges coming from the field, uh, what we have come uh, to know is that most of the skills and expertise, they are uh, uh, concentrated only at the central level, that is at the, um, in the capital and in the urban areas. But uh, if we are to go by the uh, slogan, leaving no one behind, if we do not uh, focus on developing skills and expertise closer to the users, uh, then I think uh, we will be defying this uh, slogan, which is leading the energy development across the world. Uh, so um, uh, we need to have a more reliable and uh, more, more dependable and sustain, sustainable services where energy is uh, concerned. We find that although there are uh, many efforts of taking um, if the clean energy systems to the uh, last mile, there is a larger number that go back into using the uh, 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 if you allow me to say the dirty energy, uh, mainly because once the system breaks down, then there is uh, no one to take care of it. So repair maintenance it, it, uh, is key. Uh, to the um, to the sustainable use of these uh, systems, we should refrain from looking at uh, counting the success of our projects through a uh, number of systems that have been put into place. But uh, we st we should start looking at success in terms of how many people are using it and for how long uh, they are doing uh, they are using the systems that have been provided to them or uh, they have. Uh, they are using. So these are some of the social aspects that need to be looked into rather than uh, the um, efficiency. I would say for a country like Nepal, efficiency is required, but the, our challenge is not in the efficiency. Our challenge is still 
reasonable use of the systems which have been challenged by lack of expertise and skill uh, where they are uh, needed the most. Um, so that these call for breaking away from the conventional ap approaches. Um, we need to be more innovative in terms of uh, services um, that do um, uh, that um, uh, deal on you know providing services uh, to the people and mm -hmm. also uh, as I said earlier we are talking about uh, lack of access and uh, lack of awareness uh, in terms of access Access, I would say access to the technology, access to information, which are very key, and also in terms of access to finances, because we are moving away from the subsidy-driven and grant-driven pro programs and projects to a more market-based uh, approaches, which means people need to have money in hand, and, until, and unless we have innovative models which ensure that pe people at the last mile also do have access to this financing, uh, supports it was not going to be uh, the uh, we will not be ensuring energy access uh, to the last mile and as I said earlier these things need to um, uh, be approached from the point of uh, technology for whom that means uh, who is going to use it is it um uh, the uh, simple question would be is it a man or a woman then they these technologies they need to be user friendly uh, presently, our problem is that we have been focusing too long on domestic use energy access for domestic purpose. We need to move up. We need to look into the productive sector. Uh, more and more women are, uh, as you all know, agriculture is uh, the prime economy of the country. And with uh, more and more uh, men migrating away, the women are left with uh, all the uh, work not only the domestic work, but also agriculture uh, work, which adds to the time constraint and the drudgery that they already undergo. So even those that, even the men that are left behind, they have uh, additional work to do. And until and unless we organize this sector, and that means ensuring energy is used for the machines which are going to be utilized in the agriculture sector, uh, the, I think uh, this energy for all doesn't mean only individuals, it also means uh, all the sectors that consume energy for better output, better productivity, and higher income, which leads to better livelihood uh, for everybody. And of course, at the end of the day, it's the country that is going to benefit from it. So as, in summary, what I would like to say is uh, we need to be clear on when we are saying energy for all. And we also need to be very clear on when we are saying leaving uh, no one behind. Um, do we mean only individuals? Do we mean the sectors? And if we are going to do so, we need to be, our approaches need to be very much um, user fr uh, friendly and also specifically in which area it is going to be used. Um, of course, uh, in the recent uh, election, we had 50% of women at the topmost decision-making level. But, uh, uh, I'm doubtful if we can utilize them and mobilize them in ensuring uh, that benefits do um, are uh, also enjoyed by the women. Because this is a, this uh, in our case, uh, we still need to educate this group of people because. Thing is not things are not very just because a person is at a decision making doesn't mean that they have the ability to uh, understand their responsibilities and also to uh, ensure that it is being utilized properly. So in our case, the present problem is um, educating um, the decision makers uh, regarding energy and also. Um, uh, ensuring that these facilities are uh, do reach the, uh, the last mile users. And coupling these two is, of course, a, a big challenge. And uh, as Jiska said earlier, it's not technology alone. It's also the uh, sociology that goes behind in making any intervention 
and interventions uh, successful. So uh, I would also like to invite everybody into the social discussions that take place in, uh, at the conference. And I will end by uh, um, uh, wishing you all all the very best. I miss you, miss you all there because I know there are a number of uh, topics that are close to my heart. Uh, but uh, I, I am sure these uh, the presentations will be made available. So welcome to the energy sector from a gender perspective, and understand to understand the social aspects which are even more key to success of any technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Indira. Again, I, I can't tell quite where I, whether you can see me or just my forehead or something at the moment. But um, we um, thank you ever so much. I think that all three speakers have given us a really good introduction into the, the kinds of things that we want to explore in the conference. We actually now have around 20 minutes or so uh, for, uh, for discussion. So uh, let's think. Um, could I have a couple of of uh, our volunteers that, to run the mics, that would be really helpful. Um, fantastic. And um, really, I'll throw, I shall throw this open in a moment. If I could ask, what, if, if just here and Stephen, if you come up to answer a question, you might as well come up here um, so that we can answer it that way. Obviously, we can uh, um, we can see in, in here as well. So uh, let's um, throw it open to the floor. Any? Yeah. Uh, it's first. Um, <coughs> are they not working? Were they working earlier, though? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ah. You see, we can get the technology working from the Nicole, we just can't get the technology working in the room. I am beginning to think more and more that um, transformation of uh, community scale energy access needs us to move away from thinking about grid electricity completely and start focusing more on a smaller downscale uh, renewable energy access, uh, whereas grid electricity becomes a monolith of uh, uh, aspirational uh, electricity supply. So, it being an archaic industrial relic of Europe and the United States, uh, that would be my suggestion to you. Would you agree with that? And to what extent, or would you reject it completely as an idea? Do you want to go I'm not sure that's really for me to say. <laughs> I think, you know, actually in Diffid we've been working quite hard um, over the last um, year or so on this idea of a whole system approach. And the idea being that the energy, energy is a system. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of overlapping systems here actually. There's the physical energy system, there's the flow of energy, there's the equipment, etc. And there's the grid, there's, the, there's, the, there's that. And then there's also the, the kind of um, the, the delivery system and the politics and the institutions and the utilities around about that. Um, and then there's also the, kind of the financing system and the, the, the funding and all of that. Um, I think what we've, we, you know, it's interesting, like, I don't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, sort, I'm sort of assuming there's no developing country policymakers in the audience. But, um, you know, if you, if you talk to, the, to people, now, as I often do, you know, from the Kenya Ministry of Energy or Tanzania or, or, Shilak, or Sierra Leone, they've all got quite sometimes different and sometimes similar ideas of, of what they want to do with their energy systems. Um, and so I think as, as funders, we've always got to be a little bit cautious about saying, you know, this is the solution, this is not the solution. Um, and I think what we've typically tried to do is expand, support the expansion of the solution space, more or less. So we, we've said, you know, we can see certain, you know, new opportunities, certain new technologies, certain new ways of working, which maybe 
um, you know, if you're a, if you're sitting a, in a grid utility, and you know, that's where your background is, maybe you're not exposed to some of those those off-grid technologies, etc. Um, but also, you know, I think it would be wrong of us to sort of to go too far down that road. And um, so, what we've typically done is we've said we have support to the grid, we have support to expanding that. There's a least cost element of energy access, which is going to come from that. It's always going to be the least bulk cost per kilowatt hour, and that, that is important, but not by, by no means the only factor. And there's a good proportion that the IEA reckons maybe 48% of households are, are serving the least cost way with mini grids, um, and then there's another proportion, perhaps a third least cost by off grid. Um, that might be right, it might be wrong. I think, but what it tells you is that there's, there's a range of solutions out there, and we're kind of trying to sort of I suppose support them and, and try to address the barriers we each face so that, that we can expand the options and the number of solutions available to people. I think with, with household solar and the, the, the household technologies, it's worked reasonably well because households can make a decision, it's an individual choice exercise to a large extent. Um, whereas I think for mini grids and community based systems, we found it more challenging so far because there's more overlapping governance, infrastructure, power dynamic issues, which um, I think I think have made it you know, quite a lot more challenging. And when it comes to the grid, we, we do have a substantial program of support um, in quite a number of countries, um, and you know through our multilateral contributions, we're supporting that as well. So I, I say it shouldn't be an either or. Yeah, I'll quickly follow up on that. I agree largely. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I guess the thing I would want to add to that is that um, I do think that there's a place for both at this point in time, and whatever is going to happen, a time, time, time will tell because the the, the the systems will operate um, in parallel to each other for a while anyway, and I think whilst these processes are unfolding, if we keep up good eye and, and like understanding these processes, uh, we might find out that, that the ultimate solution is a combination of both or totally uh, abandon the grid. I think like you're asking quite a moderate audience here because other people might fight you to death for this question, but we won't. I that gentleman in the was, was waiting. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Indira, would you like to, to respond to the question? Yeah, what uh, I would like to say is that uh, we should not go by one technology alone. It should be a mix because energy access and, and energy avail availability depends upon the resources and it is very contextual to the area that one is working. Besides the technology, what I would like to emphasize on is building the local capa capability to maintain and provide services related to the energy rather than going by the technology alone. It does not matter whether it is only hydro, it is uh, grid electricity or whether it is only renewables. Re uh, it should be a mix, but the local uh, expertise should, all, uh, should um, be enhanced in order to sustain it. That is uh, my point here. I think so. Thank you. Yeah. I think also that the uh, on Friday the uh, morning session is going to be done in collaboration with the Energy and Economic Growth Group, who are working with DFID or funded by DFID, um to explore specifically the uh, the expansion of national grid systems. So I think that debate will be an interesting one. And I, I said I, I wouldn't agree with John's point. Actually, <laughs> uh, interestingly, in the sense that actually we cannot move towards an entirely off-grid system at the moment, mm -hmm. given the circumstances that we're in. And exactly right, Indira's point, that it's actually about the, building the capacity to utilise electricity effectively, which is not being done by the grid at the moment, and that's where mm -hmm. the key battle is. I know there are some, some more, I can see one hand over here, there was one over there. Let's take, um, let's take the two of you that are together, and the guy over there, oh, sorry, let's take four of you, one, two, three, four. We'll take those questions together, and then we'll respond, okay? Um, I think they are just comments, and the problem that I think in the comment we are going to be able to that more. Okay. Uh, for the T program, think of the transformation. 
I just wanted to say that I think as we are further programming that, we need to be clear on the inconveniences of transformation. I think regarding to say which transformation matters, because I think I've worked on a number of projects, and when we can create jobs, but lose jobs. Sometimes the person who tries to labor against the technology could be a simple person who was selling made of code, very far projects, just because the solar panel on the roof of somebody else is meddling around with the, uh, his or her livelihood. So I think uh, we need to have, I think, a robust uh, social safety for, for, for such if I thought that's a formation very important. Uh, uh, secondly, I think for for the for Inel, who was talking about the technology and energy from the gender perspective, uh, firstly, I would want us to be more inclusive. Rather, if somebody else says, yeah, I'm talking about something from the gender perspective, it is better we talk it from the from the wider perspective, which is the social inclusivity. So in that way, it means we are not leaving anybody behind. For example, including the disabled. Uh, and the, from that from that wider perspective, let me agree with her that we really need to be clear uh, and define what is the meaning of all. Is it all? For all? Is it households? Because I think I've seen a lot of people going into household interviewing. But when you're interviewing households, for example, you interview one person. There are all people there whose views are not represented as a result of that they provided anything for household. But yet, the, and, and the people who are the leaders of the household, they think that they are representing the, uh, the person who is the old party. His energy needs or her energy needs are not represented. I've done interviews. They say, I want to have access to this, to this old man. They say, No, you know, I, because this man, I, I take care of him or I take care of this lady. In the end, you don't have access to such people. You go into, into the streets. There are people who are, for example, um, uh, they are moving, let's say, in, in wheelchairs. I think it, it, it is, the, I think, it, I don't know how to describe it, but it is quite disturbing to see people, for, for example, in the university, they are going in the street, uh, in the street they, they are still moving on the, on the wheelchairs being pushed by hand. And this is an energy. This is a really big challenge. If we just provide them, for example, with, with power the with the electric power the wheelchairs, we'll be able to release the people who are pushing them so that maybe they can go productive use. So we need to extend the meaning of energy for productive uses. So I think that's what I just want to, 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 to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, can we try and keep the, the comments as short as we can, if that's okay, so more people can speak? Um, I'll just make a, a quick comment about... So uh, could, I, could everyone actually, when they make a comment, could people introduce themselves and where they're from? Sorry, I should have asked uh, before as well. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Colin Mallet. Uh, I'm speaking later. My company is called Trusted Renewables, and I come from a telecoms background. And I'm interested in this off-grid versus on-grid. But as a telco guy, of course, we spent most of my career, I spent most of my career providing people with always on connectivity. And so um, Jeremy Rifkin, um, in his third industrial revolution book, talked about the cultural idea of users being able to upload and download electricity or energy according to needs. And so I think that the idea of a prosumer and having the always on ed electricity available, but sometimes you're uploading it and sometimes you're downloading it, I think is a great way of taking it forward. But of course, that means we've got to develop energy storage as well as generation. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing some more exciting things happen in this area. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Craig Jameson from Straw Innovations. And like Colin, I'm a recipient of the uh, Energy Capitalist Funding. Uh, we are using rice straw to make biogas. And like Colin, I'll, I'll tell you about that later. But um, I want to pick up on something Indira has commented on the focus that has in the past been on smaller scale, farm or household scale, cooking and so on, and a potential transition towards uh, more of a focus on, on industrial use. Uh, we are thinking in terms of 
what can we do to attack that market where there's 4.8 million people dying of respiratory illness and other illness related to smoke in the home? Of course, the heart says, well, let's get some clean cooking fuel to those people. But what if those people don't have money to buy the clean fuel? So you've got that catch-22. Uh, and so what we're considering is going down that route of, well, let's use it for industrial purposes, agribusiness, food processing, adding value. You then create jobs, you create income and employment in an area, and those people who have employment, either directly or indirectly, can then start to purchase the fuel as your business grows. Um, does that make sense? Is that what you're thinking of, Indira? And any other comments? Welcome on with that. We'll just take the one more um, question, and we'll do another round in a moment. So, yeah, please, um, Charlotte. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Rasetwala. Um, I really want to, to bring a different kind of perspective to this discussion in terms of the, 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 the word ecosystem. I think that's really what we're missing here when we talk about transforming energy access. Um, and I go back to Stephen's point and Jiska's point about all these activities and why are we still here? Because when we talk about providing energy access, whether it's in terms of grid or off-grid, and uh, that's a whole different discussion as far as I'm concerned, because the real challenge here is that we're providing energy access. Whichever way we do it, the reason for our failure to transform is because we're not doing it with an ecosystems approach. And an ecosystems approach means that when we talk about transforming energy access, whether we, and, and that challenge is even greater in more rural deprived communities than it is in urban and much more uh, um, established communities. The challenges and the reason why we need to adopt an ecosystems approach is because you can't just plunk the energy and say, job well done, now we can bother off. Yeah, <laughs> you can't. That's a luxury that we fool ourselves that we can achieve. And that's the hard work that nobody wants to do because there's not that much money in it at the moment because we're not thinking creatively as to how we can market that to policy makers, to different kinds of stakeholders. People just want to, to dig in and out, make their money and go. And that's why we're not succeeding. So I think part of what we need to be looking at, thinking about over these three days, is how we can move from what we have been, the ways we have been doing, to grow in, that, in this sort of multi-stakeholder forum and network, that ecosystems approach and how we can conceptualize it, how we can market it, and how we can have a different kind of business model. Because I agree with Stephen, unless you can underpin it within a business model, it's not going to be sustainable because it's, it's, this is not a charitable business, I'm afraid. Uh, and turkeys will never vote for Christmas. So we really need to have that uh, business model underpinning the ecosystems approach. So that's my challenge to all of us. <coughs> and that's the key to our failure. And until we do that, we will continue to have these kinds of discussions. And challenge households will keep on looking at us and say, it's a bit early in the morning, but as the Americans will say, don't be up my dick. <laughs> Charlotte, we'll just take Charlotte's question because I said she would, and then we'll just have some more questions. Charlotte Gray, very independent researcher at the universities at Nottingham and Edinburgh. Um, Stephen, my question is mainly to you, if that's okay. Um, I actually wanted to thank all the speakers. It's a really sort of um, great morning, I think, it's to send us up real nicely for the next three days. Um, but Stephen, your nice sort of um, four phases um, about tea and development. And obviously, if you were talking about not just looking at hardware, but software approaches as well. However, your, the sort of financial 
commitment from DIFID is still very much technology focused, sort of number two, accelerating innovation at sort of 30 million, and then all of a sudden, in order to make an impact and to do that, to implement this, the skills and expertise, there's a five million uh, pound DIFID commitment, which is a considerable gap. And so my question really is, well, maybe not for now, but as we go through the next few days, is what sort of <coughs> um, evidence is People at DFID and policymakers and funders require in order for us to justify that more commitment, financial commitment from donors is needed in this field and expertise space so we can work directly with people on the ground, our partners, our enterprises in order to actually achieve sustainable energy for all and transform the energy access. Sorry, there's quite a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'll, I'll start with the last one um, and then, you know, maybe try and cover up a few of the other bits. Um, yeah, I think that that um, allocation you saw for skills and expertise is the one that's earmarked specifically for skills and expertise. If you look at that, the Shell Foundation partnership, there's actually quite a lot in there. So I mentioned there's, there's firms, there's enablers, and there's financial intermediaries, basically. So of that 30 million, that's divided out. And of the enablers, um, that includes our support to quite a lot of different things like the um, industry associations. Um, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a few in there on talent um, and supporting um, um, different sort of, yeah, just sort of enabling the companies to do different things. Um, there's stuff on IT platforms. There's a few different things. If you, if you go back to that slide on the Shell Foundation Partnership, you see there's quite a lot more. Shell Foundation, when they started, interestingly, they were all about the lead firm. Like they basically, they thought, if we can just support firms to create this like business model, and I think the only thing I have to remember is that firms also create capacity. So if you look at, um, you know, a lot of leading off-grid firms, they might employ hundreds or even thousands of people, and they train those people themselves. I think one of the challenges we've probably seen in training as a, as an activity that donors have funded is that sometimes you do training, it's for training for training's sake if you're not careful. You really need to have that connection to what, what you can do with the training, what job are you going to do with this, or I'll just go to another training. So, um, so, I, think that, so I think it's a fair challenge, but I think there's more in there than probably you see represented at the top level. Um, and obviously the design we're getting of the, sustain of the skills and expertise is going to be an outsized um, <laughs> benefit, particularly because um, those are the numbers just for different contributions as well. That every single one of those has a leverage to it. So in the Energy Catalyst, I think we're, it's more than twice that money. In Shell Foundation, it's the same with USAID money as well. So that's just the, the core different contribution, and we, we hope that that um, you know, unleashes and unlocks additional funding across the board. Can I just add one thing to that? I did not yeah. pay Charlotte to ask that question. <laughs> that's, that's saying. Um, I'll, I'll leave maybe the others to, to maybe answer a few of those, but I think maybe the one on, on the inconvenience transformation sort of came up a little bit. And any with change is you know disruptive in, in lots of different ways. Um, and I think I think the the, the 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 good thing I think you think about is that it feels like the, the, the challenge we're dealing with has been a long-term intractable one that is of no energy access so we're trying to transform that something which I think there's strong demand for it, all the surveys say people would like to have more energy options one way or the other so I think that's a good place to start from also the energy system globally is going through a transformation it's not just a story about you know developing countries this is a story happening everywhere and microgrids in the US are a, a, a rapidly emerging phenomenon. We are, we're seeing a huge transformation in, the, in the, the, the distribution of energy in this country as well. Um, as the battery storage technology, I think, was mentioned, get cheaper and cheaper, we'll see a further change. So this is um, a great time, I think, to be working on, on, on this. And, 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 my, and my hope, you know, on an optimistic day, is that a lot of those global transformations are going to help our work, actually, um, to, to not, not sure if leapfrog is the right word, but to to make those transitions faster and to benefit from those newer technologies rather than slogging out the same route that many other, the capital intensive route many of us have, have, have countries have taken. So yeah, I, I think overall, um, you know, really good to hear about the, the stories from Catalyst and I think generation technologies is a really important area. I think cleaner technologies. Um, I think in, in the T program, as you can see, it's a bit more about um, how we get it to people. It's really the, the, the focus. We get people and we get it to productive businesses and enterprises, and there's, there's really quite a exciting, I think, set of partnerships that we're looking at to do with local value creation, 
um, and employment around about this. And we're recognizing how important those issues are to this transformation as well. It's not just the tech. If it's all perceived as being flown in from outside, it's not going to have the sustainability, it's not going to have the political buy-in, um, and it's not going to have make, create the change. So we need to kind of keep all those, those factors in mind, I think. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, I actually just wanted to briefly come back to some of the things that Liz has been talking about. Because, yes, absolutely, we need to take a, a, a more of a systems approach. The only thing, Liz, I never took you for a glass half empty person. I like, in, in my opinion, the word failure is, is rather strong. We didn't gear up quick enough. And, and I think um, now with all the innovations that's happening, maybe like people are becoming a little bit more conscious uh, about how, how we can tackle these challenges. So I absolutely agree with the type of approach, like this integrative approach that we need to take, but I'd like to keep my glass half full and then say that, yeah, we, we are trying and uh, it's time to, to get more serious about this. And, and one of the things that I uh, yeah, didn't have time to mention in, in my presentation is that for that to happen, we need to learn about the successes, but we definitely need to learn about the failures. Because somehow, as soon as you report failure in an academic publication, you ain't going to be published. But um, regularly, when, when we have interactions with local partners, and we go like, oh, yeah, this is an awesome research project. Let's do that. And they're like, already done that. Thank you very much. And I was like, well, where can we read about it? Where can we see this? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah no, it, didn't, it didn't get documented. So now whoever I, I speak to and engage with, I'm trying to convince them to, to document the good and the bad so we can all learn from it and then try and move forward. And uh, the gentleman uh, out at the back as well, thank you very much for mentioning the inconveniences in um, yeah, I 100% agree with you on that, and I think it is so important that we understand um, the situation on the ground, that we don't come in with our bulldozer, European, UK, American approaches of how we think things need to be done, and that just absolutely don't work on the ground for a variety of reasons, but we just couldn't be bothered to ask people what they wanted before we came in. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you. India, you want to say something? Uh, I, uh, some of the questions were not very clear to me, so uh, please, if I do not uh, respond to them, please forgive me for that. Um, I would just like to say that uh, there is no bias between whether it is a grid system or an off-grid system. All energy-based uh, systems, as long as they are clean, since we are also being attacked by the climate change issues, around the world, uh, clean, as, the, as long as the energy is clean, it's based on local resources, which uh, built in to also develop the local skills to sustain them. I think these issues need to be looked into. And I very much agree that there needs to be an integrated uh, approach. And integrated, uh, uh, by the term integrated, I don't only mean uh, technical, but also like uh, job creation for for the uh, locals and uh, convenience in the use for different purposes and also local skills to sustain the technologies uh, will be very helpful otherwise just pushing the technology into to the users is not going to be successful i think one of the uh, uh, issues for st uh, stacking up the technologies in in case of rural areas is because we are pushing the technologies on them. Uh, the, uh, so we land up only counting the number of technologies that are installed. We are not we are not able to uh, um, give evidence regarding the success in use of those technologies because these technologies are not for, uh, these people are not familiar with the technologies that are given to them. And anything alone is not going to be accepted by anyone. I think we went through the same process. Uh, so we need to build in with the ability and with the understanding of the users, which is very key to success of any interventions, be it energy, be it job creation, be it anything. I think that is the bottom line. Uh, if we need to bring in transformation through energy access 
especially to uh, rural areas and the developing country like ours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Indira. Um, just uh, to say to our uh, listeners online, have been very patient, but there are a couple of um, uh, questions that have come in. Um, Bernie, actually, before you relay those questions, how, how many people have we had following this over this this session? Um, we have about twenty-five. Brilliant. Okay. So, uh, would you like to put those questions across um, if they're aimed at any particular speakers? Sure. So, we have uh, two questions that have come in. One from Jean-Pierre uh, Tumundala, who's joining us from Algeria from the Pan African University. A question specifically to Jiska, and he's asking about the OGE graduate internship that you mentioned. And he's, uh, he's inviting you to say a little bit more about the sorts of activities and skills that that involves and what sort of criteria are considered in the selection process. And the second question from uh, MD Kulti of the Ministry of Energy in Afghanistan sets the entire panel quite a challenging question. Um, can you give us some examples of the best emerging practice from energy access uh, as to how that energy can be used to support rural elections, especially in Asia, but anywhere in the world? Ele elections. Elections. Uh, absolutely. So, from, from energy to uh, energy collection. That's, that's an right. interesting one. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, 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 do you want to answer that one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my knowledge of uh, mobile phones are used in Kosovo, which uh, during the period of uh, considerable uh, unrest to, to get people to, uh, to vote to mobilise voting, particularly actually for women. So I, can, I can't give you the reference now out of my head, but I can let, let the person know. Well, if Bernie contacted you, yes. Okay, then I'll, uh, I'll keep going on the, the skills and expertise development question. Thank you very much for asking that. I could I give you like an hour-long presentation just on these two alone, and I won't do that in the of the schedule. So um, first of all, I'd like to say like, I'd be very happy to communicate directly to answer any specific question uh, they might have there. But um, so really what it boils down to is that we, we will have two initiatives. One is really focused on uh, improving these linkages between the sector and recent graduates. And uh, at the moment, we're drafting these business cases, drafting that, that program of support in more detail with uh, at the end of the, well, in, in the next week or so, having um, them ready. And um, that means it's going to start happening by the second half of this year. And, um, yeah, by then, through a whole range of different channels, we will be reaching out for, uh, for the internship program for um, private sector enterprises, but also support industries, uh, public sectors to host interns, um, but also for uh, interns themselves and um, organizations that would be interested in having their staff receive mid-management uh, mid level training. Then the other program, uh, as I said, takes, takes almost like a more longer term approach by uh, starting to build uh, the curriculum needed to create graduates that might not need to go on a year or half year long internship. And uh, that will also start in, in the latter part of this year, where we will, uh, through an expression of interest, invite universities that want to work on their curriculum uh, with an off grid focus to send us applications and then work together to identify what can we do in the time frame, what needs doing, and how we will go about that. So I hope that that answer is enough of the question that we can uh, move on. Then my answer to the second question, and yeah, this is a real pop out because I'm going to pass over to Stephen in a second, is that I'm really sorry, I have not thought of this before, so um, I, I can't give you a good answer on that. But I'd be very happy to give that some thought in the next few days. And if I come up with something, I'm sure I can get a new address to, uh, to send it back. But thanks for that. Uh, yeah, really pretty amazing question. Yeah, interesting question. Um, I think the history of electricity and elections is a bit of a checkered one. Um, and quite often you see um, there's a sort of votes for votes phenomenon <laughs> where uh, people try, you know, politicians might offer electricity in in exchange for votes, or maybe even extend the pylons a little bit closer to the village, and then and then just leave them after they've got the vote. 
In fact, I recently heard of a mini-grid developer uh, who, who was blocked, essentially, by local politicians from providing the mini-grid because the, the local politicians were worried that they would lose the ability to promise electricity <laughs> to get votes. So there's some funny connections there. Um, it's, it's interesting because it's definitely obviously we do a lot of work, not in my department, but other departments in supporting free and fair elections and through all kinds of different means. Um, I'd be really, I'd be happy to connect the, the question um, asker with um, the DFID office in um, Kabul as well. And so Tim McNeil, who works there, he um, used to oversee our contribution to the Energy and Environment Program, Southern Africa, which does a lot of off-grid and different kind of electrification. Um, and I'm aware of, of some of the, the mini, particularly the containerized mini grid providers, the Redavias and the Winch Energies of this world. They um, they've got one of their sort of applications is the idea that you could bring in the electricity to power an election. Um, polling center or similar or hub and then um, take it away again afterwards. I think Joy's right, there's probably lots of different, depends a little bit how the elections are done in terms of what the energy implications are, but I think this is another quite good example of all the different things out there in the world that you don't think about if you focus on household energy access. You're not thinking about these applications and we have very live discussions with colleagues in the, um, the education department about electrification of schools. And um, electrification of clinics as an anchor load um, for mini grids has been a great way forward in getting political buy-in to, to mini grid program in Sierra Leone and to make progress there. So I think I do think the, the making these connections, these other sectors, is a really useful. Um, I'm aware that I've seen about four or five hands up. We're actually already running over 10 to 15 minutes over. Can I ask if there's anything specific you want to feed into the answer to the question about elections? Can I, can I ask, rather than, than putting it in, could you give that information to Bernie and we'll then put it up onto the, onto the, uh, the response onto the, the live system so everyone will get access to that. I'm sorry to cut, to cut things off, but there's one other thing that we need to do in this session. Otherwise, I think people will get upset with me if, people, if, if you don't have time for coffee. Okay, so uh, it's fantastic that everyone is, is wanting to contribute and I think it's really good. We've had some really interesting discussions already. Just to finish this session off, and uh, I wanted to uh, do two things, one of which is to thank all of the speakers, including Indira there in, in, in Nepal. So can I ask you that we all give another round of applause to the speakers? <laughs> and you will see also on the um, programme that for each of these morning plenary sessions, there's what we've called a two-minute PhD poster pitch. Um, and I've, I asked Anna if she was happy to do this. So I've asked Anna to come up here. Very briefly, there are some posters out that everyone have, have an opportunity to come and look at, particularly over lunch. But we're giving each of the people that have done the posters an opportunity to tell you in two minutes why you should go and look at their poster and come talk to them. So Anna, over to you. Hello, my name is Anna Clements. I'm a fourth year PhD student at Oxford University in engineering. Um, my poster is about uh, understanding the energy patterns of tier one users in rural Kenya. So tier one being the energy access level above having no access. So we're talking about um, electricity for basic household lighting and mobile phone charging. So the main kind of summary is um, I found that it is possible to find distinct user behaviors, um, distinct energy patterns within individual users and also across different users. And I've also looked at um, looked at looking for correlations between those energy patterns um, and uh, social data about the users using the system. So some of you might have heard of the SONG project, the solar nanogrid project. Uh, we built two solar nanogrids out in Kenya in two communities. Um, and one of the main components of those nanogrids is a battery charging system where people can bring batteries, charge them at the solar hub, and they use them in their homes for lighting and mobile phone charging. So I have energy data from those batteries, and I also have data about the people who are using them. So for each user, I've looked uh, within their use days and uh, clustered together similar use days to find the, the patterns of use that that user has, their typical modes of using that battery. And then I've looked uh, to compare all of the users together to see what are the general modes of electricity use for this system. And one interesting thing that I found is that there appears to be four general modes of energy use from means uh, in this solar nanogrid, uh, solar nanogrid system. Um, and uh, people have different combinations of those modes and they spend different amounts of time using energy in those ways. Um, but another interesting thing is that for the majority of users, they only actually inhabit, exhibit two of those four use modes. 
So then I mentioned that I've looked for correlations between these energy use patterns um, and social data about the users, and I've looked at the number of people in the household, uh, the ages of those people, and also the location of those people relative to the central charging hub. Um, so I'm going to stop there to not keep you from your coffee, but please do come and have a look at uh, my poster. We're really happy to talk to you about it and show you some more of those results. Thank you. Have you already signed off on the webinar? Um, right, okay, so just, uh, if you have or you haven't. No, it's still on. It's still on. Okay, so just uh, a word of thanks to everyone uh, that's been following us online. Thank you very much. We will bring this session to a close. Do join us this afternoon for the pitch from several people we've heard from in the audience about the Energy Catalyst projects. Um, so we hope to see you and others uh, on then. We're